God is good. Who was and is and is to come. Some of y'all got that down about who was and who is, but not sure about the is to come. He's coming. Some of you are not sure about the who is. You know he was, you know he's coming, but you're not sure where he is today. Well, that's what I kind of want to talk about, amen? <laughs> I am trusting that uh, when you came here today, you came wanting a word from the Lord. And even if you didn't come wanting a word from the Lord, that uh, God will start stirring something up in your heart right now. I really had this message all laid out, and I was going to preach this sermon today on this topic. And about, about Thursday, the Lord started putting my, my heart, I need to probably slow down and put this in two messages because it really is where we are in so many places in our lives in the areas of dealing with issues and problems and situations and things like that, trials, circumstances that we all go through. And it's so easy in our Christian life to, to get to the place where we're just a, a faithlessness and discouragement in our life. So I want to take this message and make a two-part sermon out of it. And uh, it's called Restoring Your Zeal for Christ. I think that every one of us who... Uh, who remember the moment in time when we gave our lives to Christ can go back to that point and remember what it was like. Even those six, seven, eight years old uh, that I've watched and witnessed come to the Lord, there's a zeal, there's, there's, a, there's an excitement that's in their heart and in their life. And I believe that uh, that is such an important part of our Christian walk in life that and Satan will do everything he can to discourage you in your walk so as to put that fire you know, down and to keep that unction from really firing up or that zeal from really, really being in your heart and life. And... Uh, even though the title's not completely on the slide, I'm hoping the sermon will be completely in your heart, all right? We can have a zeal for Christ, and it's a, it's a powerful zeal that, that God puts in our heart, and it's, I believe it starts with the presence of the Holy Spirit. But we know that even though we're Christians and have the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life, it's possible not to have zeal burning in our heart and life. So I want to talk to you about restoring your zeal. And if you want a subtitle, you call it maybe winning the battle with discouragement. Anybody ever been discouraged? One or two of you. If not right now, it's been this week maybe, or maybe in the last months. Uh, there's a lot of people in our culture right now in America that are just living with a lot of discouragement. Doesn't seem a lot of hope on the promise, uh, on, the, on the horizon. Uh, there's not a lot of, to, of things to look forward to. And it seems that everywhere you turn in the culture we're living in, there's just more depressing news and, and bad situations. Uh, I think one of the most important things after we give our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ is God puts this, in, this zeal in our life that's keeping it alive, all right? John 2, 17, there's this passage where it talks about the zeal of the Lord's house. And it's found in the context where John is writing Jesus has begun his ministry, all right? And in chapter 2, he's gone up to the first Passover during his ministry time, and uh, he sees all the money changers in the temple. And these guys are in there, and what they've done, they've made a living, basically, out of the religious system. If, you're, <clears throat> if the money you came and brought to the temple was not a Hebrew shekel-type money, it was some foreign ex currency, then there would be exchange people there, who would give you the proper kind of money for your offering. Or perhaps your, your offering wasn't good enough. Maybe you brought a, a, a dove or a, a lamb or something for Passover and it didn't meet the grade. To, you know, it wouldn't pass the inspection of being spotless and blameless. Well, which you're, right, you're in the right place. We have one we can sell you. For the low, low price of, you can leave here today with a proper sacrifice. And on, it just turned into a business. And there's supposed to be a house of God's presence and God's prayer. And Jesus comes up and he starts turning the table over and taking a whip and running these guys out of the temple. And that's where the disciples, after they saw this, it says, and his disciples remembered that it was written of him, that the zeal of thine house hath consumed me. Eaten me up is the way it says in King James Version. The zeal of thy house has consumed me. Uh, Jesus gets into the temple. He sees what's going on and there's this passion a righteous indignation, but it's a righteous fire that lights up and he says enough's enough and he deals with it. I believe it's important that we as Christians kind of discover where that is in us and what that is in us so that we live with an unction in our life. I've shared with you the story, I believe, in the past about a book I read many years ago. In fact, right after giving my life to the Lord Jesus and was doing a lot of ministry, sharing my testimony in places. And uh, my brother handed me a book called Why Revival Tarries, I believe it's by Leonard Ravenhill. You ought to find this book. I don't think it's in print out there anymore, but if it is, you ought to get you a copy of it. Why Revival Terries? And it's a very hard, hard look at where the church is and where it was at that time. It hadn't changed much. Maybe it got a little worse. But he talks about the importance of having passion in, in one part of this. And he, and he has a little area where he's talking to people who are going to be servants of the Lord and are going to serve Christ. He said, listen, with all you're getting, whatever you get, education, study, position, whatever comes your way, 
make sure you get unction. Unction. Now, I actually had a guy in, in the early service that said he, didn't, he never heard the word unction before. Well, I just told him, if you didn't got no unction, you can't function, all right? It's, it's passion. It's that fire that burns. It's that, it's that zeal that God puts in our life. And unfortunately, we get discouraged. Uh, somehow it tends to wane down. The Bible says here, the disciples remembered, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. There's another translation, but jealousy for the honor of your house shall burn within me. Psalm 69 is where that comes from in the Old Testament where they're remembering the passage and it's a prophetic psalm about the Messiah. But it says, basically it comes down to enthusiasm for your house has devoured me. Another passage reads it this way, another translation. My zeal for God and his work burn hot within me. We need to come back to that place. Well, there's a fire burning. Some people call it first love, revival, whatever it might be, whatever you might call it, we need to come back to that place. Isaiah is prophesying, and he's talking about the Messiah ultimately, but in this, this passage, and I don't know why all these are off, at least on my screen. Well, they're up on that. Okay. They're, they're crooked on mine, but works for you, all right? In Isaiah, he puts it like this. He has put on righteousness like a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head, and he has put on garments of vengeance for clothing, and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. Now, we know that Paul takes this passage and he puts it in the context of the New Testament church and how we ought to put on the armor of God and the breastplate of righteousness, the helm of salvation, you know, how we ought to be clothed for battle in our spiritual life. But it says here of Jesus that he has wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. If you look in the Old Testament or you look in the New Testament, sometimes the word zeal is not used, but it's the same idea. Whether it's used as passion or strong feelings or force or whatever it is, it's the same context. In the Bible, it means to burn with a passion about something, you know, to, to have this burning strong feeling. Now, sometimes it's used in a negative sense. Sometimes it's used in a positive sense. But it's a strong passion. In the Greek, the New Testament, it's translated 17 times this way as, as zeal. And it deals with the state of commitment to something, a passionate commitment, something which really drives you and motivates you and, and presses you forward. I think this is the idea where the apostle is speaking when he talks about, you know, he said, I press for the mark, the prize, the high calling of Christ Jesus. He said, there's something that drives me. There's an unction inside me. There's a force that keeps moving me towards God. There's a fire that's been lit in me. Jeremiah said, he said at one point, he said, he said there's this fire within me. He says, woe unto me, you know. If, 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 if I don't preach or if I don't live, if I don't walk in a righteous manner. Why? Because there's something happening in my heart. Now, what is that? If you're a Christian, if there's ever been a point in time in your life where you really got serious with God and said, I'm giving you my life, the direction of my life, he put something in you. We also know that we can, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can get preoccupied. We can set off on all different kind of courses and not be right with God in any of those courses. And what happens is the zeal is gone. We just lose it. The classical Greek word literally means have a warlike spirit. Something that you, you're willing to fight, to boil hot about. Another translation, puts, a dictionary put it this way, it means to have something that you've made a goal, that you're, it's something you're striving after and something that you're pressing after no matter what. Now, in the, in the, in the scriptures, the focus of zeal, when you look it up in the context of things, is most often the house of God. Now, you and I know, in the truest sense, in the Old Testament, that was the temple before that was the tabernacle. In the New Testament... It is this house, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and it's this collective house that we make up together as living stones, as Scripture says. And what we need in this desperate hour, and I believe that we are facing a desperate hour in our nation and our culture, is for the people of God to get a desperate, burning zeal for God again and for His body. This body, this collective body of people, that we realize that the church is the way that God has chosen to reach a generation and to reach a culture and for us to be excited about who we are in Christ and what God's called us to and be passionate about what he's called us to. But it is so easy to, to lose sight of that. We need a zeal. Now, and, and we talked about it in, a, in one context in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's bad. Phineas was the servant of God and he slew one of the Hebrew men, his brothers, for having a relationship with a, with a Moabite woman because it was offensive to God, all right? And I don't, you know, the zeal there was, it was directed in such a way that it's, it becomes questionable. But ultimately, God wants you and I to have a, a, a righteous zeal. Be passionate about it. And we're not talking about an arrogance. We're not talking about some pseudo-pious, false religious indignation. 
We're talking about a righteousness that just burns and drives and, and, and moves us forward. Now, what happens? We get saved. We give our life to Christ. God puts that in us. There's excitement about Christ, excitement about the will of God, the word of God, the things of God. We're moving forward. But, you know, <clears throat> soon it seems we quit relying on the power of God and upon the power of his word, and we just get burnt out or we get worn out. You say, what's the difference? Well, burnout is more of an emo emotional state. You just, just emotionally, you're, you're just at your, your wits, your emotional end is, is met, and you just burn out. The other side is worn out. That's just a physical thing. You know, we, we haven't rested properly. We haven't followed the biblical direction about taking care of ourselves so many times, and we just, we're just stretched beyond our limit, and we get physically just worn out. Sometimes it's both. Sometimes we're emotionally burnt out, and sometimes we're physically burnt out. And I think most of us don't need a lot of clarification on that because at some point in time, we've come to those places. We are wore out or we're just burnt out. And obviously when that happens, we get discouraged. And what happens when we get discouraged, there goes zeal. The greatest enemy of your zeal is discouragement. That's why Satan loves it so much. That's why it's his goal, his aim, his desire is to rob you of all your courage, the boldness, the audacity that you have in Christ to live what you, you, you know is true and to stand on what you believe is right. To have integrity. Zeal drives so much of that in us. So the enemy comes and any way he can, unseen he moves in, in stealth, he's in complete camouflage. We don't see it's him so many times, but he comes in and he begins to try to destroy our courage and we get discouraged. The great enemy of our zeal. We lose courage. In the Old Testament, one of the great pictures of that is as far as a personality is concerned, Obviously, in the New Testament, it's Jesus, but in the Old Testament, you have David. And he, he was a great picture of, of, of what we're talking about of zeal. He's a man with zeal. On one hand, you see this passion boiling thing. He's a warrior. He has a warlike spirit, you know. On the other hand, he has a passion for God and for the house of God. It was his son who built the temple, but it was David who supplied all the building materials, who supplied all the money, who gathered up all the things that were needed 99% of it was prepared for by Solomon's father, David, because he had a passion. He wanted to see a place built for the glory and the honor of God other than just the tabernacle. God had put it in his heart, so he had this passion. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, you see David here. He's a, he's a perfect picture of a man who's lost his zeal. And we're going to read that in just a moment, so you might want to find that in your Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 30 because it's not going to be on the big screen. You're actually going to have to look in your Bible. I know it's difficult. But we're going to look at that passage, and you see here is a man who's completely discouraged, who loses everything. He's at the end mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. He burned out. And you'll see that in just a moment. But I want to talk about how did he get there. And then once we talk about how you get there, what it is that brings us that, and how do you get out of there, Amen. Now, this is a great story in Scripture, all right? And it's, it's, it's a wonderful story, but it's a tragic story. In 1 Samuel chapter 26 and, and 27, before you even get to chapter 30, you'll see some chapters. I'm going to share one of the Scriptures from that in just a moment. Before I do, let me give you a little history of what's going on in the, in the passage. David, we know, is a young man. He slays Goliath. Uh, he's celebrated as a warrior. He becomes one of the captains in, the, in Saul's army. Saul welcomes him into his household. Make a long, long, long story short. Uh, Jonathan embraces David as his best friend. By the way, he's Saul's son. And Jonathan and David become great friends. Saul begins to become jealous, you know, of David because the women in the cr are chanting for, oh, Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his tens of thousands. That's not the way to encourage a man's ego. And so he becomes jealous and begins to seek for a way to kill. At one point, he just picks up a spear and throws it at David in, in a meeting room. Ultimately, David ends up running for his life. He takes several hundred men with him, and he runs for his life, and he's hiding out. <clears throat> for years, Saul's pursuing him. Going to find him, going to kill him. There's a few moments where it looks like Saul repents, changes his mind, but it doesn't last long. And so he's out to destroy David. David runs. David hides. David's doing everything he can to stay alive. And as the story goes, he just keeps getting more discouraged and more discouraged. 1 Samuel 30, you see the bottom of the pit. But in 1 Samuel 26 and 27, you see David <coughs> moving and running. In chapters 26 and 27, 
King Saul finally catches up to him. He can't find him, but he's got him located in the general area, all right? He knows he's nearby. And so Saul and his army of men who've gone out to find David, they camp in a valley very near where David is. Saul goes to sleep in the middle of the camp. There's no tense, it doesn't sound like when you read the passage of the story. The story. He's just laying asleep in the middle. And surrounding him are all his soldiers in a big circle sleeping around him. Saul is laying in the middle and has a spear, you know, stuck in the ground right beside his head where he's sleeping. In the middle of the night, David sees what's going on, turns to his lead general and says, Does anybody here want to go down to the camp with me? And his servant goes down with him, one of his men, and they sneak into the camp and they're standing there looking at Saul. Opportunities here. The servant says to him, David, let's end this right now. Let me take this spear and run it through his head. And, and I know how you feel about this, so I'm just going to run him through once. That's basically what you have. I'm not going to strike him multiple times. So it's not out of anger. I'm just going to kill him nicely. And David said, shall I touch God's anointing? He says that twice in that passage. Basically saying, you know, I, I know the Lord's anointed me to be king, but this is not the time, and I'm not going to push God. I'm not going to tell God how to do his business. When the time's right, it'll be right. And so you see David at two points here. When you see this great moment of such integrity, all right, this, this such character that he shows here, such patience. But at the same time, you see one of his lowest moments. Because in chapter 30, you know, you see it something else. Now, look, look at this right here in verse 27. It said, David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day. This is chapter 27. By the hand of Saul. This is after he's had the opportunity to kill him and doesn't kill him. I, I'm, it's, what's the use? I'm, uh, it's better for me that I just should run, speedily escape in the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me in any coast of Israel. So I'll, I'll escape out of his hand. And David arose and he passed over. It goes on to say with uh, over 600 men that, that were with him. And they went unto a kiss, the son of Moak, king of Gath. And David dwelt with a kiss. And in him, the Jezreelites and Abigail, his wife, was there. It was told Saul that David had fled to Gath and he sought no more again for him. So basically what he does here, and the scripture that's on the, the, the screen really says it perfectly. What is the use? I, you know, he's not saying it out loud. It's just something he's rehearsing in his heart and his mind. What's the use? I mean, I, I can't live this way any longer. I've had it. Enough's enough. I, I can't deal with this anymore. I'm just going to run. And I'm going to run into the land of the Philistines. And I'm going to run to this place called Gath. And there, I, you know, what's these? In fact, he used the word perish, and it's a Hebrew word, safa. And it, it's a word that literally means, yeah, I'm ruined. This is destruction. You know, I, it just the idea is it's consumption. I, it's, it's over. I'm consumed. It's the end. All is lost. This is no good. It's never going to work out. So you see, as we said, we have a high moment here of integrity, but also a low moment as he walks away from that. And what David is saying in the, in the context of this, you know, it's no use. It's no use. Have you ever been there? He wrote this during this time in Psalms 10. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? I don't know about you. I've felt that way before. Have you ever been there? If you're not, you will be one day. And you'll be writing that. Oh, why are you standing so far away from me? Why aren't you speaking? Why aren't you moving? Why aren't you opening doors? Why isn't something happening? Why, why am I dealing with this? Why am I going through this? Where are you? Discouraged. And Chuck Swindoll, you've heard him on the radio. He, he said he calls this getting a severe case of ingrownious eyeballitis. Ingrown eyeballs. You're just not looking up. You're not looking at, you're just looking in. All you can see is the despair. All you can see is the difficulty. All you can see is the trial. All you can see is the crisis. Psalms 13, he wrote this during this time. He said, how long, O Lord, will you forget me, Lord? Forever? He's kind of answering the Lord for him, right? How long will you forget me? Forever? How long, how long will you hide your face from me? Well, that's a difficult place to be in if you've ever been there, isn't it? It's a hard place to be in. When you're looking for answers and they can't be found and you're looking for light and it just seems all you see is darkness in the moment. And David's saying this in, Psalm, in, in 1 Samuel 27, Lord, why, what's the use? You know, he's going to catch me and destroy me. And if, but if I leave, if I just get away, you know, I can, I can find peace. If I just run, it'll be better. 
If I just go over there, get out of here, change the circumstance, change location. How many people do that all the time? They do it in their marriages, they do it in their jobs, they do it all kinds of places, don't they? They do it in relationships. I just don't need that anymore. And they just blow things off, blow people off, blow situations off. And they're kind of like David. And the truth about the issue here is that David had become discouraged, all right? And he had taken matters into his own hands and resulted in three things that I want to get to here. And we'll briefly summarize the sermon with these particular things. But if we talk about how he lost these things, let me, let me show you the progress the way it works in our own life. David gets discouraged, and what's he do? One of the most dangerous things any of us can do. He takes matters into his own hands. He says, I'll deal with this. Let me do this my way. I don't want to wait anymore. I don't want long suffering anymore. I don't want to be patient anymore. I, hey, I'm done with doing this, and this is the way I'm going to do with it. Now, what he does, he says, I shall now leave Israel. And I'm going to go into the land of the Philistines. Now, some of y'all need to think about a little biblical history here for a moment. David and Philistines, what's wrong with that picture? Y'all remember the story of him and the Philistines, right? And one particular Philistine by the name of Goliath. Does anybody know where Goliath was from? He was from the land of Gath. What does David say? I am going to flee here now. And he passed over with his 600 men that were with him unto Achish, the king of Gath. That makes a lot of sense. I'm going to go where I'm most hated. <laughs> I, in fact, this Akish, his name has to do with snakes and serpents and stuff like that, so you get a, a general idea of what kind of guy he is. But you know what? He embraces David for a while. But this is the way our mind works. You know, the mind absence from, from the will of God, rejecting the will of God, it can just do crazy things. We do, we, our biggest mistakes as Christians are made in these moments when we quit listening to God and we start listening to people or others or situations or things. And so what he does, he joins basically with the enemies of God. For us, it means us, I'm just going to walk away from God and I'm just going to go back to the world and I'm going to join in with them and I, you know, I'm, gonna, I, I'm just going to fellowship over there now. When the Bible... On the, it says just the opposite thing is the children of God, we come out from among them. Our, our closer relationships, our deeper fellowships, where are they? Our deeper relationships and our deeper fellowships are supposed to be with the people of God, in the house of God. We have a zeal for the people of God. We have a zeal for the house of God. But he doesn't. He goes where they hate him. They hate his God. They hate his nation. But there he is. He companies with them. Now, I don't know what that fellowship was like, all right, when David sits down for dinner with the king of Gath, or he lives amongst the Philistine people. I don't know what they say about him when he walks down the street, but I don't think it's high praise. I don't think Goliath's mama's happy. She's probably writing a letter to the king. You know? Somebody, something's wrong with this picture. He's right there where he shouldn't be, in the enemies of God. And how often do God's people do that, though? It's, it's kind of a spiritual insanity when we reject, reject God's voice and reject his will and reject his word. It's like we, we enter into this realm of, of deception. And now he's in the middle of this crowd. I don't think he's at the, at the meal talking about God or his homeland. He may be even listening to jokes about his homeland. He may be even telling stories about his home. Who knows? But he's not going to speak out you know, for God. In fact, if he's doing anything, he's probably blaming Saul for his problems. I can't believe Saul this. And, I, it, and that's the way people do. They, they find somebody in the church. They blame them for all the problems. Or they blame the pastor or an associate or somebody. Somebody else is the problem. We never think for a moment, you know, I might be the problem. <laughs> you know, it, it, maybe I'm not right with God. Here's the problem. If you choose to reject God and his word and his fellowship, then you go company with those who don't love God. Guess what happens? When the bottom falls out of your life, they're not going to stand with you. In fact, here's the way the story goes. David is sitting at the dinner with the king of Gath, and he says, we're going to go to battle against King Saul. You want to join us? Yeah, I think I will. David going to battle against the one he had said twice before, I will not touch God's own. David going against the, the father of his best friend. David again going against his own brothers in battle. His family, the people of God. But you see, that's where we can get to in our life. 
We keep running from the Lord. Some of you wonder why you look at some Christian brother or sister just really gone off the edge. I just don't know how that can happen. Hey, it can happen. First Peter talked about it. If you don't add to your faith virtue and made that list of things, then you can forget what manner of person you were in Christ. You know? You, it's, you just get to that point. You just keep abandoning. You keep throwing down stuff in your life, and you just walk away from the Lord before you realize what's really going on. And so he is. Here he is. He's asked to join in forces with the, the, the kings of the Philistines, and he gets his men together, and he goes up to battle front. Here's all the Philistine kings, and they see, <coughs> excuse me, they see David riding up with his mighty warriors. And all their eyebrows are raised. And they turn to a kiss and say, are you out of your mind? Have you lost your mind? That's David. Anybody knows David, you ought to know him well. He kills your best warrior. What makes you think that we're going to let him go to battle with us against Saul? Because as soon as we get in the heat of battle, he's going to begin to sympathize for his fallen brothers. And he's going to change teams. <clears throat> and then we're in trouble. And they rejected him. I get this picture. Here's David. His head down around his shoulders. Riding his little horse. With all his guys behind him. Four, five, six hundred of them. All defeated. Been rejected by my own people. Rejected by my enemies. Woe is me. <laughs> Nobody loves me. Is there any place for me in this world? Have I really come to the end? Is this all there is to the fair? You know, is this all there is to the circus? Can things get any worse? I know they can't get any worse than what they are. But I asked you to open your Bible a while ago. No, I didn't forget. <laughs> to 1 Samuel chapter 30, where you see this moment, crisis moment in his life. It says, and it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day. They'd been dry, riding home. And they came to the place, this is Ziklag, is where they were in camp now in the Philistine area, all right, that the Amalekites, this is a group from down south, had made a raid on Negev and on Ziklag and had overthrown Ziklag and they burned it with fire. This is David's, this is where his camp is, all right? And they took captive the women and all who were in it, small and great, without killing anyone. And they carried them off and they went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. And David and the people who were with him lifted their voices and they wept until there was no strength left in them to weep. Even David's wives had been taken captive. Ahinoam and, and Abigail. Verse 6, moreover David was greatly distressed. Why? Because the people spoke of stoning him. Because they were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. Now this is that crisis moment. When it, you think it can't get any worse, it just got worse. David had kind of had this idea, peace at any price. I just can't take this anymore. And there's all kinds of pseudo peace out there, by the way, folks. But it's not real peace. Real peace that leads to life and to fullness and to fruit. It doesn't come from running. It doesn't come from changing husbands. It doesn't come from changing jobs. It doesn't come from changing relationships. Real peace comes from God, all right? Because the life changes all around us all times. Sometimes we don't make the choice to do that. It just happens. But peace that sustains us, real peace. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. Not like the world does. What kind of world does the, does the world offer? What kind of peace? Well, it comes in a bottle sometimes. You can drink it up. Sometimes it comes in a needle. Sometimes it comes in a powder. You can snort it up. You can shoot it up. Sometimes it comes in monetary form. If you just get enough money, I'll have peace. They don't bring any lasting peace. Peace at any price. And so he runs, takes matters in his hand, and look where he is. I mean, look at the results of someone who takes matters in their own hand. He goes back to where he was. And one of the words says they were invaded. And by the way, Ziklag, this country further to these, this group, of, this tribe of the south of them, David had been going down there ripping them off for months. All right? You reap what you sow. So they come back, and they rob him this time. This is where he'd been getting the source and supply for what he needed for his own men and their families. And now, here it comes back, and it bites him. And he has to pay the price. And it says they've been invaded, spoiled, plundered. Then they use this word, smitten. It uses that word in the King James Version. It said that they've been smitten. And it's a word which means to be bruised, as in a beating. Wounded and bloody and beaten. Uh, you know, uh, some of you feel that way this morning. You don't show any outward scars up, but you feel that way internally. 
that you've just been beat up and you just feel burned out. No, and you, you're like David, you'll come into the camp of your life and all you can smell is smoke. Somebody been there heady and burned it all down. And then it says they were, their, their families were carried away, which gives us a little insight to realize that when we choose to take matters in our own hand, it affects more than just us. Nobody lives their life, lives in isolation. No man is an island to himself. There, there's a price to pay for those things. Carried away. Rejected by his family. Rejected by his country. Rejected by his king. And now he's rejected by his own soldiers. They seek to take his life. And there he stands amidst the ruin and the loss. And he's lost more than just physical things. So we say he's lost vision. He's lost passion. He's lost purpose. What do you do? You could just fall on your own sword. A lot of people do that, don't they? You could just continue to run and live in misery and think this is all there is. This is there's nothing more than this. That's just life in general. I hear people say all the time, well, this is hell. There can't be a real hell. This is hell. And their life's just empty. But David does something else. It says David started looking to another direction. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Now, say he lost three things. First of all, he lost vision. What vision? God had promised him in the word of God that he would be the king of Israel. God had anointed him. He'd raised him up. He'd called him a man after his own heart. But you see, on the other hand, he loses sight of that promise. And now he's saying, well, I, you know, what's the use? One day I was going to die by the hand of Saul. How could he say that? God had told him he's going to live and be the king. But he lost that. He lost, he lost sight of the promises of God. And when you lose sight of God's word and his promises to you, then certainly it introduces despair. Satan wants to tell you a lie. He wants to tell you that God's word's not true. He wants to tell you those promises and the blessings of God are not genuine and real. But you know in your heart of hearts that God's word is true. And we should live our lives with our eyes open. One eye on the throne of God and another eye out for the world around us. But we have to understand that, hey, <clears throat> God has made us promises throughout the word of God. God has said there's no condemnation to you in Christ Jesus. God has said he will perfect that which concerns you. The Bible says he which began a good work in you, he will perform it until the day. You know, the Bible tells us that we're sealed, that there's no way that we can lose sight or lose that place that we have in his presence and his family. But what do we do? We quit looking and we quit trusting and we quit believing and we close our eyes. And what we need is some kind of moment like this in our life where we get our eyes open again, like Isaiah. He said in Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord. He saw the worst thing that could happen. Close friend, some say a relative, he dies. Closest relationship. In my grief, and I saw the Lord. In my problem, in my crisis, can I look up to God? Isaiah said, and I saw the angels of God singing, holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of, he just saw the holiness of God. But you know how he knew you could tell it was God? He also said, woe is me. He saw his, un, his own unholiness. I'm, a, I'm not right with God, he says. I need to get right with God. And the angel of the Lord took a coal from the altar of, of, of the throne and placed it on his lip. To, it was a symbol of cleansing as he confessed his sin. If we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Quit carrying around that blindness and that unbelief and that darkness in your heart and just come to the cross. God, I, for, I repent. I haven't been looking to you. I've let discouragement weigh me down. I've dropped my sword. And I've laid down my shield. I just need to get right with you. And see what God does on your behalf. Get your eyes open. And but he also saw, I didn't stop there. I love the way Isaiah said, I heard the voice of the Lord. See, when our eyes get open, then we can start hearing. All right. I heard the voice of the Lord. He said, who will go for me? Isaiah said, send me. You see, not only did he see the holiness of God and his own unholiness, he saw the hopelessness of the world around him, and he wanted to be a part of God's solution. What's happening here? Zeal, unction, fire, passion, rising up. You say, well, he's just a sorry preacher. He even got a dirty mouth. He said to himself. Cleansing came. God raises him up and uses him. But he's not only lost vision, he lost passion, remember. What is Passion. First of all, when you lose vision, you know what do you say? I, 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 I'm going to go my own way. I, I'm going to perish. I'm going to die here. That leads us usually, kind of like the domino principle, leads us when you lose your vision, you lose sight of God. The next thing you do lose is your passion. What is passion? I believe it's the hunger of a heart that drives us to obedience at all costs. That thing which says, it doesn't matter what it's going to cost me. It doesn't matter what God wants out of my life. It doesn't matter what the commitment level is. I just, I'm going to go with God. 
He's right. He's he never wrong. He's righteous. He's just. He's true. He's, he's, he's trustworthy. I'm going to go with him. And that's where a lot of people drop it. They start deliberating. They start trying to make a deal. They start trying to converse with God. Say, well, I'll give you this or I'll give you that, but I don't want to give you everything. When there's passion, it kind of move, motivates us to move to that point and say, it doesn't matter what everything is. It doesn't matter what everything is. This is interesting here, folks. And don't miss this when it comes to passion in our life. What, what, how, do you, how do you know there's passion in your life? How do you know that there's a, a pressing, moving hunger in your heart? And how do you maintain that in your life? I think the biggest, most obvious sign of passion, real hunger for God is manifest in a life of prayer. Our ladies just did a conference on this, on prayer. But prayer, if you look and search the scriptures, you'll see it's one of the most prominent evidences of somebody who's really hungry for God. Now, I'm not talking about getting up and having a little 10-minute quiet time in the morning or a little 10-minute quiet time in the evening or whatever, maybe 30 minutes, whatever, in Bible reading. Real prayer is that walk. It's your life every day. The Bible says pray without ceasing. I believe we need to have a dedicated time of prayer, but it can't stop there. Real, that, that walking prayer life means that in my life, as I go through life, I'm exposing everything in my life to the fullness, to the ability, to the grace of God. That there's a dilemma, yeah, I'm putting God's hands. If there's a conflict with my children, I'm putting God's hands. If there's a situation with my spouse, I'm going with God on it, whatever he says to do. I'm exposing it to him. If there's a temptation, I'm not going to focus on temptation. I want to turn it to God. I'm going to seek God's face. This, this is what real prayer, this is where passion begins. And as you do that, and he becomes your course of action, turning to him, trusting him. Guess what? The fire starts burning. And the embers are stirred. And that prayer keeps those embers stirred up so the, the Holy Spirit can breathe on those coals so that the unction fire of the Holy Spirit can burn within our hearts. You look at David. What's he doing here in this moment? He's turning to God. He's, he's, he's finding his strength and discouragement, not in the world around him, because there's nothing there. Uh, you've probably heard the statement before. I'll say it again. The man who stops praying is the man who chooses sinning. Let me put it more simply. The man who sins will stop praying. Or the man who prays will stop sinning. The man who sins will stop praying. Or the man who prays will stop sinning. I mean, how dependent... Are we on the Lord? We, we, we all say the right things, don't we? We, we, all, we all know the right answer to that. But really, how, how dependent do, are we upon the Lord? It's really manifest in how am I and how am I handling my conflicts and my issues in life? Am I really turning those over to the Lord? Am I really seeking His face? Am I really turning to Him? Every battle in my life is not be won by sheer grit and determination. Every battle in my life is going to be won over the fact I'm spending time with God. And I'm giving that situation to the Lord. And I'm trusting Him with it. And I'm waiting to hear from Him. So what happens? We lose vision. The next thing that falls, what do we do? We lose passion. You know what comes after that? We lost purpose. And I believe that, you know, vision and passion leads to one thing. It's purpose. If you have vision and you don't have passion, you're purposeless, you know? You're just a visionary. But if you have vision and you have passion, you move from visionary to missionary. You have goals in your life. You're moving towards the will of God. You're looking for God to do something. Uh, I remember I, if I wrote this or I read it somewhere, but it just kind of came out, I put up a purpose of the outward liberation of passion and vision. And when those two meet, birth out of that is purpose. I want God's will. And I want to pursue God's will. I'm going to walk in God's will. And what I want is God's will. Wherever he takes me, whatever he's wanting, that's what I want. I'm moving forward. Are you moving forward? In your spiritual life right now, where are you? You say, well, I'm not really going forward. I'm not going back. That's in your mind. Because there's no place for spiritual stagnation. You know what happens when it stagnates? It just keeps stagnating. All right? It's a process of just deterioration, stagnation, and corruption. Our spiritual lives were never meant to be still, kind of static in one place. We're to be moving forward, moving out, advancing. 
And what happens when we get to a place, it's like a crossroad in our life. We come to it, and there's this opportunity to progress. But we don't like the way it looks, or we don't feel comfortable with it, or we, we don't want to have to deal with it, or we don't have to think about it. We don't, we don't, have to, we, we don't like confrontation. There may be a confrontation, but I'm just not going to do it. So I'll just stay here. Children of Israel wandered around for almost 40 years in the wilderness, going nowhere. Oh, they were going. They could say, we're moving. But they just wandered until they died. I don't want to be like that. I don't believe any of us want to be like that, do we? And so if you come to that place in your life where you kind of stopped at something, you say, that's as far as I'm going to go, you're wasting your time because you're, you're, you're not progressing, you're regressing. I mean, you're going back. You, it's either forward or not. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. Pretty simple. If you're not gathering, then you're scattering. So where are you in your walk? And where are you in your life? We need to ask ourselves these questions so that we can come to the honest answer and say, oh, I'm not moving forward. And God, where did, I, where did I stop? And what has stopped me? Is it just discouragement? If I just got tired of it, am I, am I kind of doing this David thing where I just said, I don't want to take this anymore, peace at any price, just let me go. And I'm just kind of moving around in circles, going through motions. I, I can preach, I can teach, I can do Bible studies, I can tell people stuff, I can invite people to church, but my own spiritual walk, where am I? Have you lost vision? Because when you lose vision, you start losing your passion. And when you lose passion, purpose goes right out the window. Discouragement. And no matter, you know, here's the thing about discouragement. If you don't turn to the Lord, nothing in the world is going to encourage you. David didn't find it in the Philistines, and he didn't find it in the king of Kish of Gath, and he didn't find it from the Amalekites who ripped him off. Everybody's ready just to kill him, and then he says, and then David strengthened himself in the Lord. The only course of action, if we ever really get honest in our life. You may be here, somebody who's never given your life to Christ, or you may be a Christian in your life or walking through some issue in your life. Hey, your only course of action is Christ. You say, oh, well, you know, we have choices. Yeah, that's not much of a choice if it's hell. <laughs> the righteous thing to do is to follow Jesus. Well, I'm not going to hell, but I'm a Christian, but I'm not really going to follow. Well, no, then, then it's just hell here now, like we said earlier. All right? Your best course of action is to trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to... That's it. And this is what David comes to. He says, I just can't deal with this anymore. And so he encouraged himself. In the Lord, there's the answer. Because if you are discouraged today, and maybe you're relating to what David's experience is here, <clears throat> you ever feel like you're at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom? You know, you get down at that bottom pit in your life. I can be sure that, you, and you can guarantee this, that when you get down there, Satan's not there to help. He's there just to kick that dirt in your face, make you feel more miserable. As a Christian, you fail the Lord. Satan says, do it, do it, do it, do it, and you finally give in to the temptation. And what happens? You think Satan's done with you since you gave him the temptation? No, he's there to say, oh, and you call yourself a Christian. You, I can't believe you did that. You say, you, you're a believer. You, oh, yeah, some kind of Christian you are. And so he then seeks to come with condemnation to keep you from seeking the Lord, to keep you bound. You need to remember this promise. And I think David finally caught it here. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And why can that be? I mean, if you did sin and you are guilty, how can there be no condemnation if you're in Christ? Because Jesus Christ took the wages of your sin upon himself already. He paid for every failure. He paid for every sin. He paid for every disobedient act you'll ever do in your life. It's all under the blood of Jesus. You just need to come and re receive it and live by it and walk in it. <laughs> Lift up your shield. The Bible says... Lift up those weak knees and feeble arms. Hold that shield up. Grab that sword in hand. Stand. Take courage. It is found in the Lord. He strengthened himself in the Lord. Now, I'll get into that more next Sunday, those four, that, the points about how, what it really means from a biblical point for us to overcome this battle. But the simple is the first point, and it's turn to Christ. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Father, I thank you that you are a gracious God.